I want to welcome you to 2021 into Bev's Open House in 2021. And it is uh, really a pleasure it's a, uh, for us for this particular program. It's quite special. Um, we, uh, you know, Bev's Open House is actually a part of introducing youth to American Infrastructure, Inc. And what we try to really do is to focus on contemporaries who are really in the business of community building. Well, today it's very special for us because we were uh, able to fund our first community builder interns, four of them, uh, four students who have actually been through the IA program. And I want to acknowledge that we were able to do that with the support of HDR Engineering. But our board of directors in recognition of a truly iconic founding board member of ours, the late uh, Dr. Juanita Jones uh, Abernathy named our community builder internship program after Mrs. Abernathy because of her absolutely extraordinary uh, life of uh, public and civic service. She was one of the, uh, actually the last, if you will, of the um, of that original four, Dr. Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, her husband, uh, the late Reverend uh, David Abernathy Sr. And Mrs. Abernathy was just the living manifestation of everything that happened in the American Civil Rights Movement. And I had the pleasure of personally working with her for five years when she was uh, on the board, on my board of directors when I was there at the, uh, the general manager at the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. And it's, uh, I was uh, getting close to 60 when I was there. And so it's uh, very unusual when you step back and you say at 60 that you can speak of someone as being a mentor, as being a confidant, a counselor, uh, and I can also say my friend. And so it is a real pleasure this morning uh, to be joined by uh, her uh, children uh, from Germany, <laughs> Wandelin uh, Abernathy, who is the oldest of the Abernathy children uh, of, of, of the siblings. And she is a, a, she's an opera singer, she's a musician, she's just extremely, all of them are so accomplished. Uh, Donzale Abernathy, who's uh, in Los Angeles, and she is, uh, as you all know, she's uh, she's an author, she's an actress, she's a, a media guru, and uh, and our and our dear Kwame, okay, uh, who is actually the youngest of the uh, Abernathy children in Atlanta, who has the most wonderful Miss Ella Grace, who's been a community and civic advocate, advocate activist uh, for all of his life. And we're also joined today by a very special person, uh, Rebby Ellisor Taylor. She's fairly recently retired as being the uh, secretary of the uh, MARTA Board of Directors in Atlanta. Mrs. Abernathy served as one of the longest standing uh, members of that board of directors. And she and Rebby worked together uh, for years and years and years. And so uh, I, we asked, I asked them, I said, you know, I would love our, our, our kids, our youth, to have the opportunity to be able to really meet you and to be able to talk to you about your mom and the legacy and all of that. And they said right away, they said, Bev, we would be where we're, we would be honored. We'd be so pleased to be able to do this. Mom would love it. And so I think I will start out, I will start out with Wandelin. Wandelin, what was it? I, I just can't even imagine. What was it like? Okay. What was it like growing up? And you're the eldest daughter. Okay. Now, I'm not aging people here now. Okay. I'm, not, I'm, I'm the oldest child. I'm the first one. Yeah. That's Wandelin, what was it like? I mean, growing up in in the movement? Well, it was for me in the beginning, I didn't, um, when we lived in, um, in Montgomery, Alabama, I really was not aware of it. Um, there were moments when, when, um, when I thought there was something going on, like when uh, we didn't play in the backyard and, I remember them coming to take our car away um, and um, standing on the porch and being afraid of the white um, 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 guards that came. I don't know, I'm trying to think what's the English word, um, state troopers. The state troopers okay. came and confiscated um, uh, our beautiful car. Um, and that was as, um, that was for the um, Montgomery to, um, Montgomery bus boycott, yeah. But then at the same time, when we moved to Atlanta, 
was when I was really fully aware of what was going on. Daddy and mother, I, I, I remember them both sitting um, us down um, and it was the us was Donzele and myself um, and um, uh, telling us um, what he, what he actually did, you know, um, he was a minister, but then he talked about how he, um, he and Uncle Martin uh, worked together for um, the betterment of, of black people and the, and the civil rights movement. And then when we went, um, uh, I could see, I could tell there was a difference, um, um, that there was something going on when we went to this um, school when we moved to Atlanta and then I could see there was, you know, this interaction with um, other young children, how they reacted um, um, to, to, the, uh, to Yolanda or to, 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 to me or to, to Donzele and more important when we went to the, to the uh, Southeastern Fair every year, then of course then there would be, you know, um, groups and groups of people who'd be always coming up and, and mm -hmm. wanting to take photographs and whatnot. And, and oh yeah, that's Dr. King and oh, and that's oh, Reverend Abernathy and blah, 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 blah. And so um, it was exciting, mm -hmm. it was exciting for me. And I realized that we were very, very privileged. I, I understood that, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't take it um, for granted. But at the same time, um, we were frightened. I know that I did a great deal, a great deal in fear. And I, I reflecting back, I'm asking, I ask myself, where does this fear come from? Is it from the bombing of the house in 1957? Yeah. Or was it the, um, um, the police or, or feeling the, um, the anxieties that my mother had at that time, um, I used to feel that too. Wondolin, what, where, where do you think her wellspring of courage came from? And I, I oh, believing in God. That. My mother, my, God. believing in God, okay. believing in God. Um, okay. The first songs um, I used to hear, um, of course, when I was a little, when I was a baby, they had a. Um, radio that was by was on the nightstand and and my parents bed there was a nightstand and then it was my bed the baby bed and there was always music on classical music and um, I just remember loving to hear my mother sing my mother would sing all, all of these hymns I learned those hymns uh, from my mother um, when she would be cooking or she'd be doing whatever, she was always singing. Now, having all, having lived this all, what, what has the impact been on your life of having lived all this of the struggle? You not, you saw, your parents were actually writing the playbook. Okay, and I'm saying and doing it. What has been the impact for you, just on your on, on your own life? Well. For so many years, um, it re religion, my my believing, my believing in in God and knowing that that um, things were going to be all right. I always had such a positive, a positive outlook. They used to tell me, my parents, you know, you're really um, uh, you're so naive, you're so positive, and I had really this positive outlook, and I've endured so much in living in the United States, but I've endured a great deal in living in Europe, you know, racial um, um, problems. Um, uh, I've had a great deal. I've had my share here too. Um, it, life has not been uh, very easy for me. Um, but um, knowing that, that, that my father and my mother sacrificed for black people, um, for humanity, that's been, um, that's, that's kept me going. Sometimes it's been, um, it's been really, 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 really hard, but they had it even harder. And knowing that, um, um, sometimes when I would sing, 
certain songs or it's, um, it would bring me back um, um, spirituals as an example. It would bring me back to um, from where I come from. All right, now, Dazale, talking to the youth today, just talking to them, okay? What do you think she'd be saying? Well, um, immediately, um, when everything went down uh, the Capitol on the 6th of January, I could hear my mother's voice. I literally could hear it. And I knew exactly what she would be doing, not that day, but on the morning of the 7th. She would have been on the phone to Congressman John Lewis's office asking, what is happening and why aren't we taking care of this? And um, she would be preparing us to fight. And so what she asked us as her daughters and uh, her sons, as well as to all the young people that she would encounter in life, you need to speak up and speak out. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, when we were little children and she decided that we needed to integrate the elementary school, she told us to speak up and speak out. So when I heard the uh, teacher across the hall in the first grade yelling at Ralph the third, my mother had already instilled in me to speak up. So I said to my teacher, excuse me, I need to leave my classroom. And I went upstairs to Wanderland's classroom and mm -hmm. told her, I need you to come out of your classroom. And then together we went downstairs to the first grade to tell Ralph the third's teacher to take her hands off of our brother. And then we went to the principal's office to telephone our mother to tell her to come to the school. So mother had taught us mm -hmm. um, to stand up and to fight for what is right. Yeah. And she used to say to us, you know the difference between right and wrong. You don't need anybody else to tell you. You know you have a conscience inside of you and then you have a moral obligation to do something. And my mother told me when we started having marches here in Los Angeles, California, especially uh, prior to 19 um, to 2016, but definitely in 2016, you better get on every single march there is. Don't get out of that house because I would be doing the same thing. You need to get up there and you need to fight. And not only did daddy fight for black people, he fought for brown people and for Asian people and Native American people and everybody. And now today more than ever, my mother would be saying to each one of these interns, get busy and get involved and make sure your voice is heard and to speak strong against injustice. And like Uncle Martin used to say, injustice um, anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yeah. And um, after Uncle Martin had died and Daddy was running the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Civil Rights Movement, and there was a power struggle within Black America for power, my mother decided she was going into business for herself. And they used to make a comment, oh, she's over there peddling cosmetics. But no, she was doing a whole lot more than that. The thing that I love so much is that mother would take these women who had never had bank accounts before in their own names, because that was the time when, you know, you weren't, I wasn't, I wouldn't have been Miss Donzele uh, Abernathy. I would be Mrs. Dar Dixon Bijarchi. I would be known as my husband's name. And she was like, oh, no, 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 no. We'd go into the bank and my mother would co-sign a loan for these black women to get their own bank accounts so that they could borrow money to then open, to get products so that they could go into business for themselves to empower women. And I can't tell you how many times I went to CNS Bank and would sit out there in the car or go inside and watch mother do this. And it was empowering. It was empowering mm -hmm. for me as a young woman. I was so proud. I remember the writing of all the detailed plans for the the whole, you know, the, the, the whole thing that happened in the Montgomery boycotts and all of that, though, that was women that were the ones in there, the strategic planning about how it was going to be Rosa Parks, because it really, I mean, all that kind of stuff like that. And then the youth, there was a children's crusade, there was the, um, all the freedom riders. I mean, so talk a little bit about that, because women, I think a lot of times people forget that women and youth were honestly essential to the movement. Absolutely. Women were, um, you know, they, they decided to organize. And my dad was the only man who was a member 
of the Women's Political Committee that Joanne Robinson had uh, founded and Rosa Parks was a, a member of that. And daddy was the number two man at the Montgomery NAACP. So when Rosa Parks was arrested and Edie Nixon had called, my dad issued the first call that following morning to the Black Ministers Conference that we should create a civil rights movement and this was gonna be a boycott and it would be daddy's third boycott. But the thing that's so incredible is that mother literally typed these uh, um, uh, 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 little uh, notices and Notice. cut them and with her own money paid these young boys and girls in the neighborhood to distribute them to let people know to stay off of the buses. And my mother attended the mass meetings and was highly involved, but because she was a wife of Reverend Abernathy, they looked at her as just a wife and wouldn't give her the credit for the things that she did. And then she opened up her house to the Freedom Riders after Uncle Maude and Uncle Retta had gone long gone and moved to Atlanta. Uh -huh. My mother and my father were still there in the thick of the movement that was happening in Montgomery, Alabama but always to make us aware that we had a responsibility in making America live up to the principles upon which our nation was founded, that each and every one of us needed to be courageous to go into battle for what is right. And as this, everything went down in Washington, DC, Dr. Scott, I know that you wanted to ask me about this. Yeah. I'll never forget that riveting moment Yep. When I saw on the news a photograph of a man sitting behind in the chair of Speaker Nancy Pelosi's desk, sitting in her chair behind her desk with his leg up on the desk, and something drew my eye to the left. I said, look to the left. And I looked to the left by the window, and I saw a plaque. And immediately when I saw that plaque, I saw my father's face. Yeah. I saw my father, I saw Uncle Maud, and I saw Congressman John Lewis. I saw James Foreman from SNCC, and I saw Reverend Jesse L. Douglas, who was still alive, and all immediately I just felt violated. And, and, and I could feel them. I just felt them around me. And they said, it's time to fight. I mean, that is the, that is the message. Anything that's worth having you don't have an expectation people are just going to give things this is time for us to fight for america my mother would be right there on the front line i know she would now kwame i talk some about you know you saw her with the whole thing in the youth programming and the community service and all of that and just talk a little bit about what your reflections were on that and what you felt like what do you think she'd be saying to the students, what she'd be saying to the students now, what she'd be telling us at Aya that we need to be doing during these times and stuff? Well, um, as I, as she, I, I know she'd repeat what she um, always said, certainly um, towards the end, uh, I guess the last 10 years, which was, it's now your time to lead. Mm -hmm. My father was 29 and Uncle Martin was 26 in December of 1955 when uh, E.D. Nixon called and my mother answered the phone and said that Rosa Parks has now been arrested and we are going to protest. Um, and I want, uh, Ralph, I want you and um, you and that young minister to go around town and let people know that we're going to boycott uh, the buses on Monday. And Daddy and Uncle Martin, went around town throughout Montgomery and let people know they passed out. Little boys rode their bicycles and passed out the leaflets um, that my mother uh, typed along with uh, a lot of other women that were in the uh, uh, women's, um, uh, women's council. But, um, you know, literally the, the rest was history. And at every speech, uh, my mother would always say that uh, Ralph and Martin were 29 and 26. Mm -hmm. And what are the average 29 and 26 year old thinking about doing today? It's mm -hmm. certainly not changing the world with their own hands. Um, so uh, she would, you know, 
re be repeating to these scholars that it is their time to leave. Yeah. Um, they get out and do the work um, that they did when they were that age. Um, it's not something that, that they asked to do. It's not something that, uh, that they, uh, I'm sure that they initially wanted to do, which was to, you know, turn their lives upside down. I'm sure my father did not want to put his young bride, his newborn child and his unborn child in harm's way in 1957, in January, I'm sorry, January the 10th of 1957, when that home was bombed and my mother and my two sisters survived that bombing. Mm. That's not the life that he saw for himself, mm. um, but they answered the alarm when it rang. Mm. Every generation has to answer the call and every generation has to answer for um, the issues of its day. And uh, the alarm rang, and I am forever, forever proud that they answered the call and uh, they wrote it out from the cradle to the grave. You know, Kwame, when you came, I, when you said it, when you started out, and you said, I, I never, I wasn't reflecting on the fact that they were twenty six and twenty nine. They were, they were you. They were doggone. <laughs> You were there. They were, they were youth. Not only were they were youth. In fact, they were the two youngest ministers in Montgomery at the time. Yep. So, um, you know, that's why the president, uh, uh, E.D. Nixon, who was the president of the NAACP at the time, the older man. Mm -hmm. That's why he told Daddy um, had just uh, walked um, Montgomery doing the local uh, membership drive for NAACP. And they would go from door to door collecting the dues, just like the insurance man would go door to door collecting the dues. So he said, Ralph, you know, I know that you have just done this. I need you to go right back out and do it. I'm going to open it to our scholars, okay, our interns, and just with any- Our future. Our future, okay, our future. Any questions that you all have, comments, observations, I'm turning the floor to you, as they say, share the mic. Okay, um, well, what's up everyone? Um, well, first, like, before I began, I just had like one question. Um, is, are there like any books regarding like the history of the Abernathy family? Cause like, obviously this has been like a very insightful Zoom meeting and like, I've definitely learned a lot from speaking to you guys, but I was just wondering if I wanted to like do my own research on this stuff, like where would I look towards? There there are two books that, that are must-haves, and uh, I share them with everybody because you, you have to have both of them. Can't have one without the other. But uh, mm -hmm. our father's autobiography, which is And the Walls Came Tumbling Down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and my sister's book, which is Partners to History. Um, one is a, um, the, the written essay, and then you've got the photographs and the, the edited comments that go along with it. You have to have both of them. And I tell, you know, for the young people, you, however you reach them, you can reach them. And, uh, you know, actually people have to be reached in, in both, both ways. You need a book yeah. to read, and then you need pictures to go along with it. Oh. Um, and, and commentary so that things can make sense. Um, and oh. So it's and and the walls came tumbling tan came tumbling down. Oh my and, god! And partners to history, you can Google them. They are unique, totally unique names, and uh, they they will both pop up in the Google search, Amazon, all of it. So hi, how you doing? Hi. My name is Aida. Um, I guess thank you for coming and taking your time out to talk to us. We really do appreciate it. Um, so I actually do have a question for Miss. I, I don't know how to say your name. You have such a beautiful name, Miss Wa Wa Wandalin. Wandalin. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good. Thank you. I like my name too. <laughs> um. So my question is. Um. So you were there when the bombing happened, right? Yes. At your house. Mm -hmm. So how did you deal with that trauma? 
exactly like I, I could only imagine your childhood home up in flames like how did you how did you deal with that trauma one well, and my does mother, it still affect I, you today yeah I, you know that's the that's the fascinating thing my mother said that I ne never awakened <sighs> I never awakened she said um and the fascin the next thing is that she described the room as being my mother, I, uh, my mother, the baby bed, then there's a nightstand. There was a nightstand. And then that's the first, there's a, a bed uh, where my parents slept. And my mother slept on the end that was to next to the nightstand where I was sleeping in the baby bed. And she described that everything around was broken everything was was uh, on my father's side of the bed everything had fallen down the plaster everything it didn't fall on her and it did not fall on the baby bed the guest room was to the to the right if you're standing in front of my parents bed uh, and standing in the door of my parents bedroom then my mother's side of the bed then the nightstand there was a window and then the baby bed, and then the next room over was was the guest room, hmm. and everything was 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 um um, um we say in, in German kaput. Everything was 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 torn and blown up. It was just um, um and she said I never awakened. Um, now reflecting, as I mentioned and spoke earlier about the stuttering. Um, because then I began to 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 to, to talk uh, later on. They say stuttering is um, um, maybe I maybe I did have some trauma and did not um, was not aware of it. Well, you know what's also so rich about this is that one of the things that I've been so impressed with our youth is that as they have talked about the program and participated is all with particularly these unprecedented times. And I wanted you to share a little bit, Aida. Aida has really been going very deeply into issues of mental health, uh, uh, balance, okay, life balance, and mm -hmm. the criticality of that. Um, I take mental health and like the advocacy of mental health very seriously because I suffer with mental health issues. I have depression and I have anxiety, and I also have symptoms of ADD. So. I have multiple things going on in my plate. It gets really hectic over here sometimes. But, you know, I understand that some people don't really have those issues, but taking like steps and coping methods from mental health and applying it to your healthy brain is also a great benefit. And it's also a great thing to do. So I just think it's, mental health is a serious thing. Yeah, it is. And we're very proud of you because you're helping to elevate the importance of this because a lot of people, and particularly in our communities, and, and to be able to be really outspoken and really free in terms of, you know, making sure to express this and the help and all of that is, is, is really good. And with everything everybody's going through, oh my God. So Yes, the pandemic has had a huge impact on our youth because a lot of kids don't know what it's like what's going on and a lot of kids are just like I have no control and when you feel like you have no control you know things start spiraling in control you start doing things on impulse and you know a lot of bad things can happen when you start doing things on impulse so you know a lot of kids have been traumatized because of the pandemic a lot of kids are stuck in their unhealthy environments because of this pandemic a lot of kids go through abuse in their homes and they find their way to escape is through school so like it's crazy to think about how much this pandemic is affecting you in the economy it's affecting our families and our personal lives it's affecting it's affecting just literally everything i can't even there's so much things i can't even put it into words guess what we're fighting back yes yes very powerfully i wanted to speak can i can i speak on what happened on the capitol dr scott is that oh, okay yeah. go right ahead okay. this is open mic and you know we keep it real so to keep it real, right, like when I saw what happened at the Capitol, it really like, it messed with me. It bothered me. I'm going to be real. It really bothered me. It, made, it kind of brought me to tears, too, because I was just like, this is so unfair. We all know if it were black and brown people storming the Capitol, we would have been shot. We would have been killed. They would have been like all hands on deck. This is a complete threat. Mm -hmm. 
finish it, get rid of this threat. Right. So the fact that only four people died in that whole event is just crazy to me. It's five people. It's been five people. Five, five, five. It's five people now. Oh my gosh, that's it. Doesn't it just doesn't feel right? It doesn't sit right with me because because we were pro us colored people were protesting during the summertime and we got rubber bullets. We got gas. We got tear gas. What else happened? peacefully we were protesting peacefully right. protesting too yes peacefully protesting. it only got rowdy a couple times a couple looting but they completely looted a federal building a federal building that's just crazy to me i just i can't in these trying times i feel stuck i don't know exactly what to do i want to i want to call representatives i want to talk to my congresswoman i want i want to i want to speak on uh, everything that i feel and i want i want there to be change Period. I just want things to change. But we can be the change. I tell people, a democracy is not free. You got to play it. And so the parts that you said in terms of I'm calling my congressman, call them. Heck, at some point, be them. And I think, um, I think um, Aida brought up a really interesting point, too, of like her feeling like um, how much control do I really have in this situation? And like, it's very easy to feel like very minuscule as like a single person in this whole country. But um, I think a really important thing to, to remember is that um, we always have to take a step back to reflect on what is within our control and what's with not within our control. So while a single person may not be able to change like the entire U United States uh, instantly, what we can do for ourselves is think, okay, what can I do right now to uh, better prepare myself for the situation and like I, I guess like the first step it starts with is like um becoming aware like uh, um educating yourself doing your research on this kind of stuff uh being exposed to these situations and I think that's a really special thing that I can bring away that it has brought away for a lot of the students that I witnessed I said this at the board of meetings um like the board of directors meeting like Aya for me personally it's like deeper than infrastructure it really just comes down to how can we be better humans and how can we improve each other's lives? Like, but at the same time, not being like um, blind to like the injustice around us. I know how important my voice is. I know how important Aida, Sydney, and Okino's voices is because we're gonna like lead the future direction of this nation. You know what I mean? So um, as long as we continue to educate ourselves, continue to have these conversations, continue to have these Zoom meetings where we're able to talk with you older guys to, to like give us wisdom and like let us know like this is, these are the kinds of things we went through. Now, what are you going to do with this information? So I agree. That's what I was going to say as well. Yeah. Um, that I have hold so much value in my heart because this is the first time I feel like in my life adults have trusted me and wanted to listen to me. Like, you know, throughout the school system, you're taught to sit back and let people tell you things, especially as a young woman, and especially on top of that, as a woman of color, as a black woman, um, I haven't really been given the platform to speak and to share my thoughts. So I feel like that's also why I value the IA program so much. Oh, Sydney, thank you. Well, I we gonna I tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna because I love everybody. This is like family side, but we're gonna hit Mr. Okino. What other kinds what is the experience been like for you so far? It's been the intern looking up to Dr. Scott, listening to their um speeches and stuff, to actually work with her, being able to being able to mentor the kids along with the beloved community project, share my opinion, my experience the year before how mine went. So I guess I could say I had, I had both sides of eye. And I know that eye is just going to be keep going up, doing its best. So what were the two sides of eye? I'm doing this because I'm telling you, he knows exactly why I'm doing it. Smart as a whip, all of that. But he is part of his thing is we are pushing public speaking. So what are these two sides of eye that you had the unique opportunity to see? I had the virtual Aya and I had the in-person Aya. The in-person Aya, we get to go to different work, um, different work fields. We've seen different construction sites. Yeah, the that was the in-person Aya. The virtual Aya, we just we had a we had more time to work on our beloved community project. We had more time to 
to be more engaged in um, the speakers and presentations, different sectors of infrastructure, meet different people, and we were, uh, we were able to work at our own pace and comfortability. Okay. Dr. Scott, yes. Dr. Scott, could we also hear um, from Rebby, who was, you know, in the throes yeah. of everything as the secretary of the board and was an invaluable resource, um, not only to our mother, but to all the members of the board and to making MARTA work in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for inviting me to this call. And I'm loving seeing uh, the three siblings here and the young people. I'm just loving this. This has been just wonderful. Um, Mm. Mrs. Abernathy, I worked with her almost 20 years at MARTA. She came on board on, on she came to um, be a part of the board of directors and immediately there was a kinship between us. Um, she, she just was a really real person and she had such a heart. And I describe her as being very fierce, but with the biggest heart. She would fight for what was right. And I, I don't know if it was Donzele or Wanderland that said, you know, she was always morally right. I guess it was Reverend Abernathy that, that initially pointed that out, but she was always morally right. She was about the right thing and not showing any favors but you know, to treat people like you wanna be treated. Those simple things that we learned when we were five years old um, carried her throughout her life and she exe you know, exemplified that in everything she did. She was just um, a really wonderful person. She was an advisor to me, she was a confidant and she was my friend. I miss her every day. You guys, turned out wonderful. I'm so happy that you're here to teach the world what you know. And young people, I, I, I know you were listening. So go out and use this information that you learned today, because it was a lot, but you know, just remember to be kind to others, to love, you know, and you know, show empathy. Absolutely. That's I it. Rebby, thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Rebby. I really like that. That just made my heart better. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much, everyone. And with that, uh, I will, Isaiah, I will turn it to you to close this out. Our Bev's Open House, the uh, Community Builder Interns, the Dr. Juanita Jones Abernathy, Community Builder okay. Interns. First one, yay! I will leave it to you. That's it. We'll leave it to you to close it out. Hey. Okay, for sure. Um, well, I guess I'd have to say thank you to everyone in here. Um, thank you to all the older people. Thank you to all the interns. Thank you to me for being here. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm thanking myself. Uh, all of you guys, you guys got to thank yourselves as well because it's not easy to be an engaged person and engaged activist um, in these kind of times, make sure every single person here is giving themselves a pat on the back. Because like I said, this stuff is not easy right now. We are in unprecedented times. This is a collective group effort. Um, there's not one single role that gets everything done. We need people on every single end. We need the Sydneys of the team. We need the Aidas. We need the Okinos. We need the Isaiahs. We need the Dr. Scotts, the Rebbies, um, the Kwamis, the Don Zales the Wandalays, like we need everybody out here. We need the whole team. So um, this is not a one person effort. This is a group effort. Um, as we continue to move forward in 2021, uh, we wish everyone a safe, healthy energy moving forward. And we ask that everyone continue to be as passionate about these issues as they have been prior. And I think the other thing that we want to say uh, is to express uh, to the incoming administration that you have uh, all of our uh, support in, in every way that we possibly can to do what we can to in fact help us to be able to heal 
uh, to heal and really come together and advance and really and truly rebuild better and stronger in doing that together. God bless you to everybody God and bless you. for 20, the rest of 2021. Take 2021, care. safe, healthy energy, man. We got Thank this, guys. You. We got this. I promise we do.